Genetic science disproves the Bible. Those were the headlines all over the place. Uh, in July of this year, there was a large collection of articles on how the Bible was wrong when it described how the Canaanites were destroyed. <coughs> and I'm going to give you several headlines, and these are not comprehensive, but they are representative. Study disproves the Bible suggesting that the ancient Canaanites were wiped out. That's the telegraph. The Independent said, Bible says Canaanites were wiped out by Israelites, but scientists just found their descendants living in Lebanon. <coughs> Daily Mail said, Bronze Age DNA disproves the Bible's claim that the Canaanites were wiped out. Study says their genes live on in modern day Lebanese people. Tech Times said, scientists find evidence that ancient Canaanites survived today. Was the Bible wrong? Ooh, well, maybe a little question there. New DNA study cast doubts on Bible claim. Mother Nature Network. The Bible was wrong. Civilization, uh, God ordered to be killed, still alive and kicking. Boy, all caps. Obviously, somebody has some emotion invested in this. Genetic evidence suggests the Canaanites weren't destroyed after all. Well, we thought they were. Canaanites weren't annihilated by ancient Israelites after all. Study disproves the Bible's claim that the ancient Canaanites were wiped out. Canaanites survived biblical slaughter, ancient DNA shows. DNA versus the Bible, Canaanites, uh, Israelites did not wipe out the Canaanites, cosmos, which for what it's worth is apparently an Australian. Uh, this goes all over the world. The Bible got it wrong. Ancient Canaanites survived and their DNA lives in modern day Lebanese. Wow. That list, by the way, is courtesy of uh, uh, evolutionnews.org in an article entitled, For Culturally Illiterate Science Reporters, Ancient Canaanite DNA Yields Occasion to Slap the Bible Around, which is a pretty good uh, description. Uh, all of those together. Now, it's not just the wannabes, you know, the science news that, that tries to sound hip and stuff. Science Magazine itself had a title called Ancient DNA counters biblical account of the mysterious Canaanites. So, yes, the story is against what the Bible says. Well, actually, after maybe not coincidentally, uh, Tim Standish wrote a letter to Science Magazine. They changed their title. Ancient DNA reveals the fate of the mysterious Canaanites. And if you look at it now, you can't find the original article. What you can find is the title that I just showed you, but you can see that in the, um, in the um, uh, uh, web address, you still have ancient DNA counters biblical account mysterious Canaanites which was the original title. So they changed the title and they changed some of their paragraphs and in fact they state they did so. Update 12 uh, p.m. 28 July. This story and its headlines have been updated to reflect that in the Bible God ordered the destruction of the Canaanites but that some cities and people may have survived. So they got a little cautious and they backed off. Now, the question I have is, is this just hype on the part of the newsmakers seeking a hook to grab people to get them to read their summaries? Did everybody just uh, conspire together? Well, actually, no. The original article in question is Haber et al. Continuity and admixture in the last five millennia of Levantine history from ancient Canaanite and present-day Lebanese genome sequences. 
kind of a boring title that you wouldn't catch uh, much going on. It's available online for what it's worth. And it's, um, it was published in the 27th of July of this year. So this is the actual source. And you will see that those people weren't exaggerating, that it was actually in the article itself. Let's go over the abstract, which doesn't really tell you much but it, about that question, but it does give an idea of what the article was about to begin with. The Canaanites inhabited the Levant region during the Bronze Age and established a culture that became influential in the Near East and beyond. However, the Canaanites, unlike most other ancient Near Easterners of this period, left few surviving textual records and thus their origin and relationship to ancient and present day populations remain unclear. In this study, we sequenced five whole genomes from approximately 3,700 year old individuals. That's 1700 BC for what it's worth. Now, it's not clear, uh, is that before present, which is 1950, or is that before present, which is 2017. But the, those numbers will start to diverge and pretty soon people will have to be specific about what they mean. Um, but, you know, what's um, uh, 67 years among friends. Um, the individuals from the city of Sidon, a major Canaanite city-state on the eastern Mediterranean coast. That's important. It's Sidon. We also sequence the genomes of 99 individuals from present-day Lebanon to catalog modern Levantine genetic diversity. We find that a Bronze Age Canaanite-related ancestry was widespread in the region, shared among urban populations inhabiting the coast, Sidon, and inland populations, Jordan, who likely lived in farming societies or were pastoral nomads. This Canaanite-related ancestry derived from mixture, from it should be a mixture between local Neolithic populations and Eastern migrants genetically related to Chalcolithic Iranians. So keep that in mind. It's, uh, you're going to see a whole bunch of things weaving in and out together. Um, we estimate using linkage disequilibrium decay patterns that admixture occurred 6,600 to 3,550 years ago which means that it could have happened any time during that period of time, so it's not very specific. Coinciding with recorded massive population movements in Mesopotamia during the mid-Holocene. We showed that present-day Lebanese derive most of their ancestry from a Canaanite-related population, which therefore implies substantial genetic continuity in the Levant since at least the Bronze Age. In addition, we find Eurasian ancestry in the Lebanese not present in Bronze Age or earlier Levantines. We estimate that this Eurasian ancestry arrived in the Levant about 3,750 years to 2,170 years ago. So, um, why uh, 2,170? Well, you know, Alexander the Great moving through. Um, during a period of successive conquest by distant populations. Uh, again, they're being nonspecific and they're estimating. Um, but so this is basically 23 and me come to Lebanon. And that's what it's about, except for one thing. They were able to find uh, five Canaanite burials in Sidon and they were able to get DNA from the Petrus bone of those people, which is interesting given the rapidity with which uh, DNA decays in uh, moas from uh, New Zealand. Uh, pardon? Well, it, it's, that's another interesting question, too. But um, Now, the Near East, this is the beginning of the, the article itself, and I'm going to read the first two paragraphs more or less straight through, and uh, 
when we come to the bottom of the second paragraph, you're going to find the part where everybody quoted. The Near East, including the Levant, has been central to human prehistory and history from the expansion out of Africa 50 to 60,000 years ago through post-glacial expansions and the Neolithic translation 10,000 years ago to the historical period when ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Phoenicians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and Romans, and many others left their impact on the region. Uh, it's interesting that the Greeks are left out of that uh, list. And it's particularly interesting given the history of Tyre. Oh, I'm sorry, you're, you're correct, you're correct. The Greeks, are, the Greeks are put way early and then not down here, which is where I would expect it to be, um, given Alexander the Great. But uh, they, they seem to have forgotten about him. Um, aspects of the genetic history of the Levant have been inferred from present day DNA, but the more comprehensive analysis performed in Europe. Now, one thing I want you to notice that as we're reading this, let's go back to the one before, you will notice uh, that this is reference, that's reference, this is referenced. Aspects of the genetic history of the Levant have been inferred from present day DNA. Reference, two references. But the more comprehensive analysis performed in Europe, and there are about what, uh, five, six references there, have shown the limitations of relying on present day information alone and highlighting the power of ancient DNA uh, for addressing questions about population histories. And again, reference. Unfortunately, although a few DNA results from the Levant available so far are sufficient, although, are sufficient to reveal how much its history differs from that of Europe, and again a reference, more work is needed to establish a thorough understanding of Levantine genetic history. Such work is hindered by the hot and sometimes wet environment, which is why the Petrus bone is so nice, but improved uh, ancient DNA technologies, including the use of Petrus bone as a source of DNA, and the rich archeological remains available encouraged us to further explore the potential of ancient DNA in this region. Here, we present de genome sequences from five Bronze Age Lebanese samples, that is, the 1500 BC or thereabouts, and show how they improve our understanding of the Levant's history over the last five millennia. So we're going to learn a little bit extra. Um, and again, notice that throughout this there's still scattered references. During the Bronze Age in the Levant, about three to four uh, thousand years ago, a distinctive culture emerged as a Semitic speaking people known as the Canaanites. The Canaanites inhabited an area bounded by Anatolia to the north, Mesopotamia to the east, and Egypt to the south, with access to Cyprus and the Aegean through the Mediterranean. Thus, the Canaanites were at the center of emerging Bronze Age civilizations and became politically and culturally influential. And those of you who know history will remember Phoenician traders being all over the place. They were later known to the ancient Greeks as the Phoenicians who uh, 2.3 to 3.5 thousand years ago, colonized territories throughout the Mediterranean, reaching as far as the Iberian Peninsula. Carthage was a, Greek, uh, a Phoenician colony. However, for uncertain reasons, but perhaps related to the use of papyrus instead of clay for documentation, few textual re records have survived from the Canaanites themselves, and most of their history known today has been reconstructed from ancient Egyptian and Greek records the Hebrew Bible, and archaeological excavations. Many uncertainties still surround the origin of the Canaanites. Ancient Greek historians believed their homeland was located in the region of the Persian Gulf. That's um, the Iranians, maybe? But modern researchers tend to reject this hypothesis because of archaeological and historical evidence of population continuity through successive millennia in the Levant. The Canaanite culture is alternatively thought to have developed from local Chalcolithic people who were themselves derived from people who settled in farming villages nine to 10,000 years ago during the Neolithic period. 
Um, notice that um, they they have uh, in the abstract they were mentioning, and we'll come to it later, uh, that they're about half Iranian and half local farmers. And that means that a good share of it did, in fact, come from the Persian Gulf. The ancient Greek historians were right. And the people who uh, discounted that, or at least partly right, and the research and modern researchers who reject this hypothesis were incorrect. Interesting. Maybe there's been a, a skepticism of ancient history that was not necessarily warranted. But here's the choice piece. Uncertainties also surround the fate of the Canaanites. The Bible reports the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people. I didn't know that and I read my Bible, but um, <clears throat> Uh, if true, the Canaanites could not have directly contributed genetically to present-day populations. However, no archaeological evidence has so far been found to support widespread destruction of Canaanite cities between the Bronze and Iron Ages. Oh boy. That is worthy of a discussion all by itself. In fact, I think we've done that once or twice um, uh, no archaeological evidence has so far been found to support widespread destruction of Canaanite cities between the Bronze and Iron Ages. And, um, and then continuing with that sentence, cities on the, uh, that should be a semicolon I think actually, but uh, that's how they put it. Cities on the Levant coast, such as Sidon and Tyre, show continuity of occupation until the present day. And that's even more amazing if you know your history. Um, and then they just move on. Um, ancient DNA research has the potential to resolve many questions related to the history of the Canaanites, including their place of origin and fate. Here we sample the Petrus portion of temporal bones belonging to five ancient individuals dated between 3,750 years and 3,650 years ago from Sidon, which was a major Canaanite city-state during this period. And I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things that I find interesting. Those of you who are th uh, more interested can look at the uh, article itself. Why chromosomes, uh, chromosome genotypes were jointly called across males from the 1000 Genomes Project, present day Lebanese, and two identified Canaanite males. So apparently there were three females that they did the other stuff on, using free bays. Um, uh, and they have a version there. And again, that one's reference. Did you notice that that whole thing about the Canaanites? There are no references. Additionally, we sequence whole genomes of 99 present-day Lebanese individuals with informed consent using this stuff. Uh, and we merged the low coverage Lebanese data with five, four high coverage um, Lebanese samples. Oh, I, that's a 31, should be a superscript. 1,000 Genomes Project Phase 3 CEU. So what they're doing now is they are not just using their own data, but they're using data from other people. Um, and sequence data previously published from regional populations, that is, Egyptians, Ethiopians, and Greeks. So they're, they're not just doing their own work, but they're also comparing it with others. And, and there's some other work that's been done. Um, skipping down a paragraph, these results support population continuity in the region and suggest that, by the way, it's a large paragraph, um, and suggest that several, several present-day genetic disorders might stem from risk alleles that were already present in the Bronze Age population. In addition, SNPs associated with phenotypic traits show that Sidon BA and the Lebanese had comparables skin, hair, and eye colors. In general, light, intermediate skin pigmentation, brown eyes, and dark hair. 
with similar frequency, frequencies of the underlying causal variants um, in a couple of genes, but with uh, side NBA probably having darker skin than the Lebanese today, with, with, f from variants in uh, one of those uh, uh, genes, resulting in darker pigmentation. So they're probably well tanned. The PCA shows that Sidon BA clusters with three individuals from early Bronze Age Jordan found in a cave above the Neolithic site of Ein Gazal and probably associated with an early Bronze village close to the site. So apparently they, um, they had some more uh, DNA data. I'm not clear whether they did that themselves or whether they got that from, a, uh, uh, from an article. This suggests that people from the highly differentiated s urban culture on the Levant coast and inland people with different modes of subsistence were ne nevertheless genetically similar. In other words, you have farmers, Bedouins, or whatever, and merchant-type people, and they had the same general uh, genetic makeup. Supporting previous reports that the different cultural groups who inhabited the Levant during the Bronze Age, such as the Ammonites, Moabites, Israelites, and Phoenicians, each achieved their own cultural identities, but all shared a common genetic and ethnic root with Canaanites. And of course, what that means is that the Canaanites and the, and the Israelites were really kind of the same genetically and therefore, um, therefore ethnic, uh, well, we'll get into the controversy in a little bit here. Um, we then used uh, uh, QPADM to test whether Sidon BA can be mod modeled as a mixture of Levant and in any other ancient population in the data set and found good support for the model of Sidon BA being a mixture of Levant N and Iran CHL. 48.4% and 51.6%. So basically 50-50, a little bit more coming from Iran. So you can see that the, um, that the ancient Greeks who said they came from uh, 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 Mesopotamia were pretty much right. Now, there were, of course, multiple reactions to this from a conservative viewpoint. I'm just going to give a few of them. The one is the David Klinghoffer article we already cited. One of them is uh, C. John Collins. Breaking news, science disproves the Bible. And uh, I wrote a letter to the editor of the article in question. It has been received, but I have not received a reply. So you get to see what I wrote. And uh, I, um, the Bible doesn't say Israelites exterminated Sidonians. And I start out, in an otherwise well-sourced article, Haber all stated, uncertainties also surround the fate of the Canaanites. And I read that before. Bible re uh, reports the destruction of the Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people. If true, the Canaanites could not have directly contributed genetically to present-day populations. And then I go on and finish the rest of the quote, but I also notice that cities on the Levant coast such as Tyre, Sidon and Tyre show continuity of occupation until the present day. And I found that an interesting problem too. It's not just the Bible that they messed up. Um, no references are provided for these statements, and at least two of them appear to be incorrect. Well, there is some variation in the text as to whether the Canaanites were to be annihilated reference two and three, are merely driven out, which is by far the majority. And the basis of removal seems to be more cultural than racial, as evidenced by Rahab and her household being spared when Jericho was destroyed. And again, references to that. What is beyond dispute is that the Bible states that the Israelites, in fact, did not drive out all the Canaanites specifically including the tribe of Asher in whose territory Sidon was located. 
The text states that the Lord promised that the Sidonians would be driven out, but they were specifically recorded as being left after the conquest. So from a biblical perspective, it is not surprising that Canaanites and specifically Sidonians would leave descendants in the general area. The statement that the Bible reports the destruction of Canaanite cities and the annihilation of its people is simply incorrect and especially with regard to Sidon. In addition, while Sidon apparently has been continually inhabited, Tyre was destroyed by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. Thus, it is incorrect to say that Tyre shows continuity of occupation until the present day. It might be appropriate to have someone with expertise in biblical studies or history review an article before making statements about such subjects. <laughs> and there's the references. Um, and the Alexander the Great, obviously you can't get a biblical reference for that, but uh, I put one in that's actually quite old, 1979. Uh, and, you know, um, it's pretty much undisputed that Alexander the Great, in fact, uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the, the city of Tyre on the mainland but the island of Tyre survived. Everybody just moved out to the island. When Alexander the Great came on, he decided that he wanted to take over Tyre, and so he built a causeway. Basically what he did was he scraped everything off of the city of Tyre and dumped it into the sea until he built a causeway out to the island and basically turned it into a peninsula instead of an island and then went on and, co and conquered it. Um, and so to say, you can say that of Sidon if you want to, that it, that it was never destroyed in that way. But to say that of Tyre is just incorrect. And that's not biblical even. That's a problem with history. These people wanted to make a point and they cited what they vaguely remembered from their history and never went into it in any kind of detail. How is that peer reviewed? Pardon? How can that be peer reviewed? That is a good question. You know what it is, I think? Is that the peers knew as little as they did. It's bias Yeah. I mean, because if this had gone to anybody with either biblical or historical knowledge, they would have gone, wait a minute, you've got to change that paragraph. I mean, if they had simply omitted uh, Tyre, they would have been okay on that end of it. And if they, had, if they had said something about how God commanded the Canaanites to be destroyed, um, but it didn't happen, and so therefore this confirms the biblical uh, story, or at least that part of the biblical story, then you could uh, probably understand that. But that wouldn't have gotten those juicy headlines. Anyway, so let's look at those references. Uh, the first one, of course, is the article itself. Um, Deuteronomy 7.2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them and show mercy to them. Deuteronomy 7.23, But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. That sounds like pretty much destroy them, period. Um, uh, there's one that I found after I went through all this list. But the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God commanded thee. So, yeah, there are texts that say pretty much get rid of them. Now, this is interesting because Deuteronomy 20 is a whole chapter 
where it says, if you go to fight against a city and they say, oh, we give up, you take tribute from them and you leave them alone. Now, if they fight against you, then you can kill everything in there, all the men. The women, the children, the women, the women, the children. Why make it? Uh, it sounds like they're not supposed to kill the kids at that point. It's just the people who have rebelled or who have fought. Um, uh, we'll come back to that, but um, but th these things, uh, these cities, uh, you don't save the women or children, you just, everything goes. Exodus 23, now, these are the ones that say drive them out. And in fact, some of them don't even say you drive them out. The earliest ones in the record say I will drive them out. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite bef from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate, and the beast of the field multiply against thee. Sounds like I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this by, uh, if I can put it that way, non-lethal means. Yeah. Uh, boy, yeah. Uh, by little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land and I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even to the Sea of the Philistines from the desert under the river for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Now before that I'm going to do it. Now it says it sounds like you're going to do it. So some ambiguity there. Exodus 33, 2, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Exodus 34, 11, observe that thou what I command thee this day. Behold, I drive, I, now here's God saying, I will do it. I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. So, these the same people but here, they're not being exterminated, they're simply being driven out. Exodus 34, 24, For I will cast the out the nations before thee, and enlarge thy borders, neither shall any man desire their land, when thou shalt go to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in a year. Don't worry about going to the Passover feast and having everybody else take over your property, because I'm going to get rid of those people. But cast out, sounds more like getting them out of the area than it does killing them all, doesn't it? <laughs> Numbers 33, 51 and 52, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you're passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out the inhabitants of the land before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. So again, this is the driving out. Now, of course, there are people who say, well, they see, Deuteronomy was first and the other ones were second. Of course, that's not the way it's written in the text. And uh, there's actually reason to believe that a good share of the Peace Code was before Deuteronomy anyway, um, even if you're skeptical. And so this is the early stuff. Get rid of them and out of the way, and then later on it is exterminate. Deuteronomy 4.38, and this is still Deuteronomy now. To drive out nations from before thee, greater and mightier than thou art, to bring thee in, to give thee their land as an inheritance as it is this day. And Deuteronomy 7.20, Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them until they, they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. Again, the hornets come back. There, there, there are two motifs going on, and I would maintain that the Deuteronomy later ones are after the other ones, and that it's the ones that won't be driven out that will wind up being destroyed. Joshua 2.19, and this is where it's actually happening, 
Uh, this is evidence that it was not a racial thing. It was a cultural thing. This is the story of Rahab, and it shall be that whoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on her head, if any hand be upon him. I want you to notice that Rahab's house is, is safe territory for anybody, not just Rahab, her mother, her father, brothers and sisters, first cousins once removed, friends, whatever, right? You're in the house, you're safe. It doesn't have to do with blood. It has to do with culture. Joshua 6, 17, And the city shall be cursed, even it and all that are in them, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house. Because she hid the messengers that we sent. She's on our side. And race has nothing to do with it. And Joshua saved Rahab the heart of the alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. Because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. As a matter of fact, if you read um, Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, you find out that Rahab was an ancestor of Jesus. Jesus had Canaanite blood in him. So much for racial purity. As a matter of fact, Jesus had Canaanite blood in him from Tamar as well. And so this, this whole thing that it's a racial, uh, it's baloney. Joshua 17, 12. Now this is where they didn't drive out what they were supposed to. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Joshua 1, 19 and 21, and the Lord was with Judah and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. And I'm gonna just give you the intermediate verse as well. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. But, excuse me, and uh, the children of Israel, uh, the children of Benjamin, did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwelt with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Obviously this day, Judges is being written before the time of David, because David did in fact drive them out. Judges 117, yet neither did Manasseh, uh, in fact I think yet does not belong there, <coughs> drive out the inhabitants of Bethshean and her towns, nor Tanak and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Boy, it doesn't sound like even in Canaan proper that didn't happen. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, or the inhabitants of Nehelol, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon. That's Sidon. That's the very city that we're looking at nor of Alab, nor of Aksib, nor of Helba, nor of Apic, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath. But they dwe he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became tributaries unto them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. So there's this whole list of people, including the inhabitants of Zidon, that were not driven out. Now, Joshua 19.28 does um, have a list of 
uh, the people where Asher was supposed to go, and it says in Hebron and Rehob and Hammon and Cana, even unto great Zidon, I'm going to give you the verse that begins that whole list. And the fifth lot came out for the tribe of the children of Asher according to their families, and so and there's Hebron, and, and that includes Zidon. So Zidon was given to the tribe of Asher. Um, and God did promise to drive them out. And by the way, notice that this is all driving them out, not massacring them. All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon unto, I believe that's Mesopotamia in that particular spelling. And all the Sidonians, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. Only divide it, thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance as I commanded thee. So yes, they were supposed to go all the way to Sidon. But in Judges 3.3, 3, Yet, pardon me, now there's another yet that I left in. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to pr prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that generation of the children of Is only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at least such as before knew nothing thereof. Namely, these are the people that are left, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites, all the Canaanites, well, obviously not all, but a good share of them, and the Sidonians, and we're talking about Sidon in the, in the article, and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Belhermon unto the entering in of Hamath. Sounds like they didn't get rid of much at all. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandment of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. Now, leaving aside the theological implications of what was going on, namely serve their gods, what does that tell you about Israelites? It tells you that if you ever find them, you're going to find a mixture of whatever Israelite is and Canaanite, right? So the genetics are going to be all mixed up. And that does not assume that the Israelites weren't a distinct people before they uh, went into that area. That assumes uh, that they were they would still be a mixture. Judah being one of the first to have taken a Canaanite wife, and uh, well, first for his sons, and then sort of de facto for himself, and, uh, and the line that goes through Jesus took that particular Canaanite. So, Yes, there's a lot of admixture of Canaanite in, in the Jews of today. There has to be. Um, it seems obvious to me that the premise of the article is flawed. The Bible clearly records that the Canaanites, especially the Sidonians, which is what they were testing, were not exterminated. The media are just too eager to print something that discredits the Bible. The peer-reviewed literature is too eager to prove the Bible wrong, or at least some parts of it. But I want to make an even more important point. You may remember this quote from Richard Dawkins, which got quoted in one of these articles that was pulling everything together. God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. You may remember this quote jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now, I think that we'll have to plead guilty that uh, God is jealous. However, 
there are a couple of things that are thrown in there that I don't think are fair. One of them is, is he an ethnic cleanser? And one of them is, is he racist? And I think the answer is no to both of those. And I'll, it is not enough of a defense of the Bible to say simply that the Israelites did not wipe out the Canaanites as God commanded because you still have, well, God told them to. Why didn't they do it? And they were wiping out a whole nation because of their race. And if we get caught up in the defense of Christianity by saying, but the Bible was still accurate, it just said God told them to be um, racist uh, ethnic cleansers, but they didn't actually do it, then I think that we've actually given up a good share of the store and that it should not be given up. I would argue that the Bible records the absence of the intention to commit genocide. Canaanites, and in my opinion, Amalekites that wanted to worship Israel's God were in fact accepted. There wasn't a problem there. First, Rahab was saved and everyone in her house. You'll notice that there are no limitations made on whether they were parents, brothers, sisters, even blood relatives at all. You're in the house, you're safe. You're in the house says something about your allegiance. Um, the deciding factor was not race, it was culture. I'm gonna come back to that. When the Lord told Saul to destroy the Amalekites, which is another one of these, you know, kill them all type of things, he first sent a message to the Kenites to leave the Amalekites. I don't know if, if you remember reading that, but it's there. Okay, now there's no record of Saul going through the Kenites to be sure there were no Amalekites going with him. No, he says, look, you're our friends. This kingdom is against us. We're gonna wipe it out. Leave now. Any Amalekite that wanted to pretend he was a Kenite, you could do that. Now, there'd be some social pressure not to do that so I wouldn't say that it's perfectly free, but you could. You could say, you know what, I'm with the Kenites, I'm leaving. The Mosaic Law is very clear on the status of strangers that do not challenge the rule of the Lord. Leviticus 19, eight, uh, 19 which has 19.18, and some of you remember this one, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Has another passage in it that's even more interesting. And which, in context, happens to impinge upon Jesus' comment about uh, the Good Samaritan. Because let's read that. If a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. Not ye shall not kill him, but ye shall not vex him. You, should, you don't even bother the guy, okay? But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and you shall love him as thyself. This is the same chapter that says you love your neighbor as yourself. So he's talking not just about the neighbor, but about the stranger as well. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Does that ring a bell to anybody? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, what comes next? What? What, what is that the preamble to? Does anybody know? First commandment. The first commandment, that's right. That is the preamble to the Ten Commandments. 
fact, in some people's counting, it is part of the first commandment. So this is the intention of the chapter. It does not just mean your neighbor. It means anybody. In context, it clearly means anybody, and that's why when Jesus gave the example of the Good Samaritan, he was being perfectly fair with the text. Now, you may not see it right away, but culture side versus ethnic cleansing is a major improvement. Cultures, in fact, can be worthy of extermination. I'm not saying that we should do that right now. I am, in fact, a pacifist. But I want you to think about a culture that very recently we exterminated or tried to. It's coming back now, as some of you may know. We didn't kill all the Germans in World War II. It was not an ethnic cleansing. But we did insist that the ringleaders and all those who remained loyal to them be put to death. Now, World War II is probably one of the most moral wars ever fought. It's uh, really hard to argue. Um, it can be done. It has been done. I have done it. But it's hard to argue that we shouldn't have fought World War II. Um, and I, I do think that it's arguable as to how you do it, but I do think that, uh, that it's a good thing that na Nazi culture was crushed as thoroughly as it was. Although, because it's human nature, you can expect it to come back. And by the way, you can expect communist culture to come back too in a slightly different form. And they will rear their ugly heads and they will do the same kind of bad things. Um, and that's one of the reasons why war doesn't always settle it. But then I'm of the opinion that nothing really settles it, that the only way to settle it once and for all is to have the people who are committed to God completely separate from the people who are not. And that's what the judgment is for. But the point is that there are cultures that are that bad. And what is forgotten sometimes is that, um, that the Canaanites were that bad. Many who react to the Israelite culture side really don't think they were that bad because after all they believed in uh, free love and isn't that a good thing and uh, it unfortunately has now been documented that in Carthage, which is a Phoenician colony, many infants were burned to death. They died, their bones were dumped in places and they were burn bones. And the evidence suggests that this happened because of some kind of ceremonial thing. That is to say, they were killed in the service of the Canaanite god. That raises interesting questions about our exception, uh, acceptance of abortion. Um, questions that I'm frankly, I uh, find uh, have interesting uh, implications. But culture can apparently get so bad that God can find it appropriate, certainly, to drive it from the land. And if the children of Israel got resistance to people who didn't want to leave the land, I can understand them destroying those people. Now, uh, that's my opinion. We could go on for a long time, but I'm going to leave the rest of the time to you. Is that an infant skeleton there? Actually, no. I think that's a, uh, one of the skeletons that they uh, got some of the Petrus bone from.
Oh, okay. It's an adult. Because you ended on <coughs> the uh, Phoenicians doing infanticide. So I yes, just I thought did. maybe I did. that's an example of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is actually one of the photos that accompanied several of the articles. <coughs> well, thank and you. I just took it from one of them. Uh, while I have the mic. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if you don't mind, Doctor. Yeah. Um, we can go a lot of different directions with this. I want to at least open the minds of some people here. Some of you have heard me on this before. And that's a presentation I did at Glacier View, year 2003. And it was dealing with the language of Genesis 6 to 9, the flood language, and interwoven through that language a lot of uh, references to what we call um, the mystery religions or the, uh, um, you know, the worship of uh, Baal in terms of uh, sexuality. And you have a uh, religion that uh, combined worship with sexual practices. You had cult prostitutes. And the Old Testament, especially Jeremiah, says that they worshiped on every high hill under every green tree. So it doesn't seem like they were actually in temples, but they were on top of the mountains in groves. The Bible talks about the Israelites were to destroy the groves and the people worshiping there. And so in the flood story, it talks about God wiping out the groves. Uh, in it other words, the same word. I just curious. it doesn't use the word grove, but it says that the waters were at the top of every high hill. Right. The expression "every high hill" is a unique expression uh -huh. to these. Uh, very corrupt uh, religious practices. Now, getting back to infanticide, um, if the practices were based on um, ritual um, practices in the temple of sexual practices, they had priests and priestesses as well. When the female priests would get pregnant through the practices, it's very likely that the infants were thrown into a heap somewhere, and then they would continue their practices. But That's a, in some circumstances, such as Carthage, they were actually burned and then thrown into the Yeah, heaps. and burning is also connected with um, worship practices. I think you're right when you use the word ceremonial. And so when God destroyed the earth, he was basically targeting these very corrupt practices. Now, I believe in universal destruction as well. Is you can't just destroy one pocket without affecting the whole earth. But um, this became a model for what the Israelites were to do in destroying the Canaanite practices. So with one destruction by water, God is the one destroying the earth. Right. With the other, it's destruction by uh, the sword, as well as the hornet. I don't know what hornet means, but they were to drive out the Canaanites. I, but that's another topic. So I'm just uh, bringing in some research I've done that I think has a bearing on this. Yeah. Um, you know, this is wiping out a whole culture that was so degraded that was so abhorrent that uh, there's no way that the Canaanites continue living amidst the Israelites with those practices. I, I think you're right, and I think that there's another point too, and that is that the people who are making the loudest squawks about this happening are people who really don't mind those practices. I think almost any comment that could be made, and I'm presuming to make some, can be seen as inconclusive and incoherent on this particular subject. 
and besides, I'm deaf, so I may have missed some things that have already been said. But of course, number one, there's the flood, as we so frequently talk about in this class. And God came pretty close to genocide and human anicide in that yes. event. Yes. Number two, uh, this is more of a question than uh, a comment. Perhaps you could straighten me out on what exactly Paul meant when he over and over again in his uh, ministry to the Gentiles, which included a pretty mixed bag, of course, but they were culturally distinguishable as Gentiles, that, uh, that his ministry and the ministry to the Gentiles had been kept secret since the beginning. And uh, it sounds like from that that it was a secret and perhaps that meant that it was a secret because the Jews chose to keep it a secret and did not obey their commission to go to all the world, even in in uh, the earliest days of Israel, just as they chose not to destroy when they were specifically destroyed. They, there were certain cities, if I recall correctly, that uh, the Jews were specifically told to wipe out completely. And when they didn't, and uh, certain people kept um, riches, and didn't kill everyone, God was extremely wroth with them for not having done that. But on the other hand, that didn't apply to the whole, the whole region of Canaan, apparently. But there were certain cities yes. in which he yes. made that really specific. It was going to be a wipeout, and you didn't do it, and that was displeasing. Now, it's, it's interesting um, that the story of Bethel has uh, the people who are attacking it finding this guy and says, how do you get into the city? Um, and then he being told, no, listen, if you tell us how to get in, we will leave you alone. Mm -hmm. And so he apparently took his, it sounds like he went and took his family, according to the text, and went off somewhere else. And that was the model that was in originally, I think, intended, is that the people would be moved out rather than being destroyed. But they didn't want to go. And it's that same model of, you know, you have a city and they surrender to you, I leave them alone. But if, you, if they resist, then, then uh, it's not the maleness that, that makes a difference, it's the ability to fight back. Uh, I see this as kind of God's way of saying, at first, the, before the flood, the, uh, the response of God to evil was to leave it alone. Cain couldn't live with anybody, but he wasn't killed. He was just simply sent out. How do your relatives live with you after you've killed your brother? Um, and a mark was put on him and said, nobody kills him. And the result of that was only evil continually. <clears throat> after the flood, God tries in a way, tries a different tack. He says, okay, people who kill, they get killed. There's a new order around here. That didn't work out so well either. Jesus has come down. We have a new order, which is kind of a partial mixture of the two. The, the secular authorities take care of the, the uh, killing. Uh, the Christians mind their own business, try to live the way they're supposed to. That isn't working out too well either. And I think the whole point of it is to demonstrate not only that evil 
is evil, but also that evil and good really can't mix. There is no way of peaceful coexistence, so to speak, because the evil will not tolerate that either. The evil needs to be in charge. And that that's really what's happening is that this whole thing is a big experiment, so to speak, demonstrating that, that evil and good really cannot coexist. And we're living in the final stages of the third round. And when it's singularly shown that evil and good cannot exist together uh, peacefully, that at that point God can draw the curtain down and say the experiment is done. That's to put it in kind of a, a great controversy perspective. <clears throat> and, you know, the same people that will criticize um, the Israelites for being too vigorous will also criticize the antediluvians for not being vigorous enough. And the truth of the matter is that neither approach really works because evil simply will not allow itself to coexist with good. That's how I view it. A couple of, and then one over here. Yes. Uh, it seems to me one of the uh, important lessons here is the behavior of the scientific community. Uh, we can talk about these other details and all kinds of things here. But this is an example, I think, that we need to take seriously. Uh, because the public image is science is correct. Uh, you talk about fake news, and you talk about all kinds of things of polarization. Science comes through. No, we, we've got it right. Correct. Uh, uh, and the fact of the matter is, they do really good at DNA. They don't do it quite so well at history. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about some of the DNA, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I think this is a, a lesson that uh, should not be forgotten. Uh, this has been the case for ever since science rejected God in the middle of the last century, or uh, middle of the 19th century. Uh, it's been the case that uh, science has won this respect because it dealt with uh, testable material things. Uh, but uh, this tells us that there's something behind here. There's an agenda behind here that people need to know about. Yes. The mistakes are all made in the same direction. And it's at a certain point, you start suspecting they're not mistakes and that they're actually uh, or, or their mistakes in the service of, of, of the agenda. And I think that's a really important point for us to realize. These things are not being done in a vacuum. They're not just uh, people trying their best. The fact of the matter is that all of these other secular outlet, uh, outlets were quite willing to take the conclusions of the paper and run with them without stopping and thinking and saying, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. However, we have so many different kinds of Bibles now. So people who are very superficial thinking, uh, they might even go to uh, New International uh, version Revised Standard, American Standard. Yeah, but, but we have to be so very careful. You see, 
today your presentation really truly gives me a pause. Science says so, therefore it has to be right. St. Paul says science so called. We have to think about it. You see people who are, you see Paul, there's a mob attitude now in this country. Let's face it, there's someone who came up with the fake news. I think uh, we know who it is. So, yeah. But it is so very true. It's a, it's a mob attitude that we're seeing now. You probably know that Thomas Jefferson uh, bust has been painted over uh, even Abraham Lincoln's and uh, George Washington's. Where is this going to stop? You see, can this come someday to a situation like that? There, there's a million people or so in this country, and there's several million around the world who are really crazy and nuts. Let's go get after them. Can that happen? Can the mob really be whirled up? Let's go after these guys? I think so. Well, the thing yeah, you have to remember is that Germany, before World War I, was the cultural capital of the world. Yeah. Intellectual, whatever you want to say. And they went crazy. There's no reason why we can't do the same. Uh, it's, we, we make a mistake by viewing things from hindsight and then trying to erase what happened before. No. It's been done before. It has been done before. And those who fail to learn history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, I think in this country uh, we see uh, there's a growing population that has nothing called responsibility. And they're the ones who uh, don't care, get sick, go to the ER. Um, whatever, someone gets pregnant, government is going to take care of it. Um, and so, the, well, without responsibility, they can go and be mobs and do whatever and burn down places. And I think we are seeing some a movement that's gaining strength, and uh, there's a snowballing effect that we're seeing. And you can never tell what this is going to end. I, I mean, the last couple of weeks, it's just scary. I mean, it's not scary. I think we should rejoice <laughs> because our salvation right now. Yeah. Yes, behind you. Is there a significance in the fact that the sentence said the Bible reports? It, it seems to me that Christians say the Bible states. And that sentence said the Bible reports. Is there any significance in that? Is there a connotation with that? Uh, pr probably so. It's, uh, uh, they want in the end to be able to cast out on the Bible, so it makes it easier if it says the Bible reports. And of course the Bible doesn't report. That's the craziest thing about that whole thing, mm -hmm. is that the Bible is very, very clear that the Sidonians were not exterminated or even driven out. Um, and why anybody expected the people who live in modern day Lebanon in that area not to be basically Sidonian is beyond me. And um, where, where was the article from? I missed that. Wh American where was Journal of Human Genetics. Say it again. American Journal of American Human Genetics. General. Okay, journal. And the thing of it is, you would never have heard of this article except that uh, they put in that little biblical thing, right? I mean, it would have been one of those things down in the bywater somewhere that, uh, okay, so the Lebanese are descended from the Canaanites, who cares, right? But they put that hook in it, and that's why it, you know, roused all this excitement, and that's why we're dealing with it in class today, is because they had to connect it to the Bible. Isn't it interesting that you still have science and the Bible being a, 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 uh, a, uh, a subject of interest? How did you find it? Well, actually, um, I think that um, 
Tim Standish announced that he had written to them and that they had changed their headline uh, at one of the meetings that I went to. Oh, I and I thought, well, this is interesting. You know, I have to look at it in more depth. And, and so what you see is what you get. Mm. Um, and, you know, you're encouraged to kind of root around. And the Internet's a wonderful place to find stuff if you... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bible and Japanese. Insist that they are Phoenicians. They yeah. are not Arabs. They speak Arabic, but they are Phoenicians. That's what they tell us. Okay. The, for, the, for the audience, Lebanese are, are insist that they're Phoenicians. And it turns out, according to this, that they're right. Yes. So it's true that uh, we need uh, science, we need more knowledge, as we need more uh, biblical knowledge to to explain this very hot topic. Um, it's true, as we know, um, the Israelites, they didn't fulfill their mission, even though that God said so. Uh, that's hot, a hot uh, topic when the whole Bible is talking that we have to love sinners and hate, if I can say, the sin. Um, so we need, as I said, we need uh, all, we need more knowledge to, to understand why did God say so, in spite of all other Bible texts that says, love your neighbors. Right. Um, to come back to, to, to your topic, I haven't been on the beginning. Um, the science try always to somehow, or some, as a new age to disprove the Bible. But as you uh, pointed out, uh, Canaanites, they, they were there, still, still they were. So there is a DNA. What kind of fact do they ha have to disprove the Bible? I haven't been on the beginning to, to know that, but I don't think so that, that they have real facts, you know. No, they don't have facts, and actually, now that people are starting to look at the whole context, the people that write this basically are acknowledging that, no, the Bible didn't actually say that the Canaanites were all destroyed. Yeah. In fact, it's pretty clear they weren't. And specifically, the Sidonians don't look like they were even pushed, let alone destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so why would anyone expect any other result than what they got is not clear to me. Um, they had to throw the hook in. And the fact that they had to throw the hook in, you know, raises some interesting questions about uh, what they're really up to. It really speaks well of God that he included all of the failures of Israel. Yeah. It it uh, it helps us to get a better sense of evil versus good. Yeah, and I think that you know the, that some of the failures were due to people who couldn't see killing other people and didn't want to do it. And and so it was, um, if I can put it that way, understandable failures. Um, and I think that we see the same kind of thing in our society today as well, uh, where there's, you know, a lot of sympathy. Uh, how tough, how tough should you be? And it's especially true if you're, you know, like me, you're a pacifist. Now, what, uh, does that mean you don't fight for anything? Uh, or, or do you not stand for anything? Or what do you do, you know? So I, I, think, I think the problem is it's an insoluble problem. And it's the reason why when God finishes up, he's gonna have to separate the sheep from the goats because the goats can't be allowed to live with the sheep. They just can't. I think you answered the question. Uh, it was just simply, how do we live 
then in this culture, you know, because... I, I'm sorry, I, how do we give? How do we live, you know, within our culture? Because, but you answer, you know, that's what I was thinking back then. I understand how God wanted so much to, I mean, to teach and to give a better life, right? To back then, to give example and to... So the word extermination, is, we see it in a different way today, right? He was trying to exterminate evil, per se, but I, even God, I think, sees that there is no way, to, not, not now, not yet, yeah. to exterminate. The, the other thing to be said about the flood is that anybody who really felt that the culture was that bad had 120 years to decide to throw them their light with a, with a boat that had plenty of room and the same thing was true in Rahab's day. There was a house, I'm sure they could have packed it with more people than it had. Nobody wanted to be in there. Because, you know, those guys, they're for the enemy. Um, and besides, we like the way that we have our religion set up. It's working pretty well for us. Um, the same thing is true um, you know, in AI, the soldiers went out of the city. If you wanted to leave, you could have left at that point. Um, there were a lot of places where you had your opportunity to get out. The uh, Saul was sent messages. Messengers is not said, he, not told that he actually was told to do this, but certainly did it. Sent messengers out. Look, we're coming after these people. If you don't, if you don't believe like they do, then move out of the way. Um, uh, Nineveh. Yes. Yes, Nineveh. Nineveh. The whole city changed, and it and it and it changed. Yes, 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 the messenger really uh, didn't like it because he knew it was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. God, I told you, I didn't want to take this job. <laughs> and, um, and what you're seeing is a God who really doesn't care about race, but he cares a whole lot about culture. And what people do to each other is far more important than what DNA they have. Amen. And I think if there's one message to that, it would be that, that there are cultures that get co totally corrupt. And we should never step aside from that because we're afraid that we're going to be called ec ethnic cleansers because that's not what God's about. It's not ethnic cleansing. It's about changing the culture. And the culture will change on its own fine. If the culture will not change on its own, there are some things that people do for culture. And anybody who objects, just remind them of the 1940s in Germany. Is that the kind of culture you want? You know? And if the answer is no, then you believe in cultural change too. In fact, the people, anybody who is willing to have fought in World War II is automatically by that point saying that they're willing to uh, kill in the name of culture change because that's what it's about. Um, and that puts us in a very difficult situation and it especially puts us in a difficult situation in Seventh-day Adventists. Um, our response has been, we're willing to die for the cause, we're not willing to kill for the cause. I think that's a defensible position. But the position that, uh, that should not be taken is, well, you know, neo-Nazis, doesn't matter, it really matter. No. That battle was won. It was won intellectually fair and square. And it was won on the battlefield. But it's sure a tempting position for some people to take. And the opposite position can be tempting for some people to take. Uh, 
because it reaches down to us. But God says that all of that kind of culture where, where you ignore God and you do it your way because that's what you want to, it can't last. And the promise of God is it won't last either. Maybe in some cases, some of us are asked to do it. Maybe in some cases, which is more ideal, God will take care of them. Let him have the hornets. Anyway, next week we'll talk about circular DNA, so stay tuned.